So this story is about Alice Margatroyd, who lives in the Forest of Magic. One cool summer evening, the Hakare Miko paid a visit. The world was pink and orange, smoothed by a breeze from the west that set trees creaking and swaying in halos of rushing leaves. Alice's modern western-style college is built, buried in a gentle mayhem, crouching in a rough clearing with no roads for miles. She'd been sweeping off the stoop, enjoying her solitude as the cool air darkened and thinking happily in a long night of research ahead of her. The Miko touched down a few meters off and waited politely for her to notice. Alice waited and watched her corner of her eye, wondering why such a lazy woman bothered her to come all the way here. Rimu Hakari cut a soft, unassuming figure in the reddish gloom, all fluttering sleeves and flowing hair and calm eyes. So different from Gensuko's other guardian, except for the laziness. Alice finally straightened and leaned on her, leaned on her broom. Miko, she said mildly. Magician, Rimu replied, half smiling. How are you doing these days? Alice couldn't help but feel suspicious. Why do you want to know? No one's heard from you in a while. Rimu came forward a few paces and squatted in the base of the stew. Stoop. After an awkward pause, Alice sat facing her, setting her broom across her knees. I guess I'm a little concerned. I just prefer to keep to myself, Alice said. Here was an odd situation, since when was it a Borough Guardian's job to play social worker? Life is simpler that way. What, do you think I'm plotting something? And do you think I only come calling when it's time to beat people up? Rima chuckled, shaking her head. What a troublesome life that would be. Alice had no idea what to make of that. Well? Okay, being honest, I do get a little leery when a powerful magician type yokai disappears in the woods and cuts herself off. I don't think you mean to wreck your terrible vengeance or whatever, but you know how it goes around here. Lonely, bored yokai are the stuff incidents are made of. Um, uh, Rima slipped back into her rear and folded her legs. So I'd rather help you now than blast your kingdom come when you build an army of gigantic war dolls and march on a human village, you know? An, an army of what? She asked finally. That's ludicrous. Well, it sounds ludicrous now, but what about in 30 years, or 50, or 100? I'll manage. It was hard to tell the magician might have been a little disturbed, and I don't see how I could apply the principles of Dalmate to anything you call gigantic. Well, she did try layer for sure, but this I think this is referencing that, because in one of the games she did make a quote Goliath doll, so yeah. Well, from what I'd seen, you'd find a way, Rima shrugged, especially here. <clears throat> they sat in silence for a few seconds as twilight washed the sky green. Anyway, I've decided you need a friend, Rima said. Oh, you have, I also replied coolly. She's going to come by tomorrow, hope you at least give her a chance. It should be fine, you have a lot of interest in common. And if I decide to fight her off instead? Oh, she'd love that. Rima read her fingers with a cunning look. She's been getting antsy and unmanageable, and I really hope she got a chance to blow up some steam. You see, I win either way. Hmm. Alice leaned back and said, I could simply leave. And leave all your valuable books and artifacts open to plunder? Plunder? After blowing all the rules, she's stuck. You're sending her here? If you're thinking the same her, yeah. Marisa Kerisame, why would you... What is the meaning of this? A harsh cloud rose from Alice's house, the violent motion of dozens of dolls. Th this is extortion. The mad yokai exterminator. Oh, wait, hold on. And Rima glanced past her in concern. Marisa will come for a fight unless this is what you want from her. Relax, will you? The mad yokai exterminator. Alice's voice seemed now with tension and um, uh, quiver in her shores. The starlight berserker coming to my house, and you want me to relax. Is that what they're calling her these days? Rima asked, smiling. I like it. Honestly, that sounds pretty badass, the starlight berserker. Right up there with the crimson watch guard. Look, me and Marisa lies outside of fighting yokai. We'd have to. You know this. You remember being human. Marisa isn't coming to level your house anymore. I came to seal you just now. We're just pissing you to make sure everything is alright. Alice stared down at her. It is so hard to believe that I'm content with being left alone. I don't know. Maybe I made the wrong decision. Rima stood. But look, you have hundreds of years ahead of you, and interest in preserving the peace. Can you indulge a couple of silly humans for one day? The breeze had turned, filling the silence to stretch between them. <sighs> Fine. Good, she'll be around by noon. I hope you guys have fun. Oh, and Alice? What? She in turn. Even without that book of yours, you're one of the toughest opponents I've faced. I'd love to have a friendly sparring match sometime. The offer struck a nerve she often tried to forget she had. I'll think about it. All I can ask, she said, and took flight. I like this Rimu. She's very good at being a meteor, which is surprising, but it makes sense. Alice's plan and I of research was shot. She just couldn't focus on her formulas, and a doll seemed to be staring at her accusingly. Her eyes slid uselessly over the page of page, absorbing her nothing. She was coming to realize the place to wreck and no one around to care, so her clothes grew tired and grubby. Rimu could have given her some more warning. The walk she took to clear her head didn't help, but she came across a lost traveler, so at least that was fortunate for someone. She decided to put him up for the night because he didn't look like he could handle a run-in with a night sparrow, let alone anything dangerous. His torrent of gratitude crashed against her back, ignored. On the way home, she decided it was only one way to work out her next course of action. She left her guests on a stoop with a pair of three-foot guardian dolls and spent half an hour tearing the ground floor apart and hurling in some semblance of order. She didn't especially care what he would think, but it was hard to work with him. It'd be hard to work with him getting underfoot. Finally, Alice stood back and looked at her handiwork, half noticing the dolls ushering the traveler in. 
The main floor is all one room divided between a carpeted sitting area, a kitchen floor of polished stone, and a small hardwood stage across one wall between one set of stairs going up to her bedroom and her going down to the water closet in her secret workshop. Colorful hangings and pictures from all over studio covered every wall, three thick in some places, and mountains of dolls of every description are heaped on every free surface, though she at least managed to clear a decent space between them. Fragrant ca um, candles burn, tended by vigilant metal figures. Now that the ground floor is an or she can get to sorting herself out. Not being skilled in introspection, Alice created a game called the Rainbow Council to help externalize things. Hidden them on the porcelain and plastic multitudes or seven special Shanghai dolls in varied dresses. Ignoring the traveler, she fished them out and arrayed them on the stage in an inward facing circle. It was long before a stir, threatening a struggle in their little ceramic feet. The dolls weren't alive, of course, they're bound to her mind by sorcerous strings and completely under control. But. With practice, Alice figured out how to delicate control particular dolls to smaller portions of her mind, eventually even her subconscious. Her skills eventually improved the point where exercise like this became not only practical, but fun. Here, here, said the yellow doll in a high-pitched, clear voice. The colors weren't consistent, but yellow often gave voice to her super ego. The Council of Alice convenes this night to discuss our response to the deplorable violation of our privacy and the imposition of one unwelcome guest, one Marisa Carey Same. Unnoticed, the traveler heaved a sigh of relief and he realized they weren't talking about him. Clearly, there is but one response, Green announced, trying to center stage. His voice is deeper. We must drive this affront to our dignity and sovereignty away. We must prepare our strongest spells, armor doughtiest dolls, and lay the most cunning traps our sterling mind can devise. And if that should fail, why, we always have the grim Absolutely not, Red snapped. The words came out thinly like shaved ice. Well, even without the grim moral, we can... I feel it's just in our challenge, Blue said, enunciating carefully. We should welcome this, Marissa. We've accepted the task of receiving her, and this, like every result, every pursuit, demands excellence. That's all it is with you, Purple observed in a soft voice. Excellent. Excellence. Never mind if the thing we're doing excellently is necessary or even good. But I do agree. I too are eager to learn more about our Marissa. And what back and come of this, pray tell, Blue asked. She might want to come again, Orange said, and again and again. And so, then we must drive her off, Green boomed. But then she'll come again, and if we attack Green, Arlen Schnurl, she'll be coming to fight instead, don't you understand? We don't want a yokai hunting lunatic coming here at all. We don't want anyone coming here. Basic kindness to lost humans is one thing, but there's no reason under heaven we should be required to, to, to grovel to this beast. Oh, we're groveling now, Yellow said mildly. I must have missed that memo. That's what will happen, Red said quietly. It remains sitting, hugging its knees. We'll end up groveling. Again. We're too weak to stop her. Even the book were too weak. They can do anything they want and we're powerless to stop them. The doll, doll shuffled uncomfortably for a moment. Are we really so desperate for company anyway? Orange finally asked. Well, I am kind of lonely, Purple admitted. Me too, Red Ad. There was my word of sense. You know, I think that building that army of dolls is a great idea, Indigo suddenly announced. I think we should do that. Why don't we make nice with Marisa tomorrow, learn her weaknesses and maybe Remus, and then conquer the village. Don't that sound great? We could rule Gensuko with an iron fist. Don't be ridiculous, Blue Cat. We all know the first thing about rulership. We could learn, Purple suggested, but I feel it would take time for more interesting subjects, and why waste time marshalling army we could be studying? What a doddering shut-in. Why waste time slugging through dusty tomes we could be locked in battle, Green demanded. There's no other thrill like it. You're both fools, Orange Cut-In. You're focusing on your little pedagenes and ignoring the real problem. Oh, and you're not, Miss I Want to Be Left Alone, Yellow asked, and rubbing the bridge with its glazed nose. Even though, enough of the personal attacks, guys. We're all the same person, remember? And they go miss the entire conversation. And then, once again, Sokyo is under our control, he gather our forces and attack the moon! And from there, we can reach the human world! <laughs> Green pushed in to go over. As much as my heart thrills the idea of such a battle, you know it cannot be. It cannot. We are too weak, Red said mournfully. Always and forever, even if we became a monster, how could we fight all of Gensokyo? You have no desire to rule anyway, Gen Yell added, merely to take an own. You're hard to deal with sometimes, honestly. I'll show you hard to deal with, Indigo spat, flailing to its feet. Yellow took a better step back and the doll started brawling. Um, while watching it, Alice was almost frightened how easily her attention split and how virtually her various facets struggled against one another. It was all happening when they were in mind beneath her awareness. Part of her really did want to lay lace to the land that hurt her. Part of her really did love the force and pain and magical combat. Part of her was always cringing her defeat by Rimu, terrified the next one beat her might not be so merciful. The winner, Yellow announced, holding Blue's hand in the air. The two of them stood up a colorful pile of twitching dolls, seeing that the viewers around the house had joined in for some reason. <laughs> So it's decided. We'll be the best host we can be. Thoughts, Council? Marisa and I enjoy a friendly match, Green suggested. We should save any thoughts on our research, Purple Ad. Just don't be too nice. We don't know anything about her, after all, Orange said. But don't make her mad, though, Red cautioned. 
I'm sure will amaze her, Blue said confidently. And with that, the doll has collapsed. Al sat back and breathed a long sigh, collecting herself, getting used to the fact that, yes, she was in fact just a single person. <laughs> well, now what? She hadn't been playing for sleeping that week, but a few hours would do her good after this exertion. If she rose with the sun, there'd be still plenty of time to get ready for her visitor. The traveler clapped hesitantly. He had no clue what was going on. Al Schultz in surprise. Normally she would have been on to the next thing, leaving the human to his own device, since she'd spent the last 20 minutes thinking intensely of being a good host. Are you doing alright? She said over her shoulder. Any injuries? Uh uh. No, no, thank you. Now she'll more closely realize the visitor is a little more than a child. He was tall and delicate with short wavy hair and big brown eyes, struggling to make himself as small as possible. He wore a drab hemp tunic and tired cloak, made most surprisingly out of place now with his colorful plush landscape. Da da, that alone gave Alice an idea how he must feel. She tried giving him a smile but only flinched, somehow she forgot what becoming a yokai had done to her dental battery. Ooh, she has fangs. So where are you going, young man? Oh, uh, if anything, I'm more comfortable now she was paying attention. Well, my family as far as having trouble this season, so I'm gonna work in a new village and get some money back. There's a new village? Uh, yeah, I guess the yokai have gas for a whole town from a scary place you visit and now are trying to get used to things here. They want young people to come and learn to work their machines, is what I, so that's what I'm doing. His words came quickly and nervously. He probably never sat down and had a conversation with a yokai before, that he knew of. I, I hear they're nice, though. That's interesting. I suppose we can't call your home the human village anymore, can we? They're calling it Mugawa these days. A new place is called Thunderdome. What a brash name. I was spent a few seconds thinking, but couldn't find anything else to talk about. The conversation seemed to send her guests on edge anyway, so why not, why not try a bow gracefully? Listen, I'm going to sleep upstairs, but you'll be safe here. Watch. She went to the door and took hold of a tiny deadbolt in both hands. Straining, she threw it aside a distant echoing boom. And the boy yelled in surprise and laughed. This cottage is my fortress and these dolls are my army, she said greatly. Also, she was realizing this for the first time. Why did she need a fortress so badly anyway? What exactly was she hiding from? You're under my protection tonight, young man, so rest well. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Of course. As soon as the words left her mouth, the trailer curled up in a lounge chair and went out like a light. That hadn't been so painful, had it? Um, Alice started up the stairs and decided she felt pretty good about her odds of dealing with Marisa tomorrow. But her feeling of well-being fed and dissolved by the morning. She spent the first hour day bustling around a second floor in a futile bid to find presentable clothes, finally setting a pink frilly white dress that would look more at home on one of her dolls. She sat down to clean her teeth, mentally directing a doll on a delicate task of brushing her hair for the first time in months. The face in the mirror looked a lot healthier than she was used to seeing, though. Maybe she should sleep more an hour or two every other week? The morning was bright and cool, with cottony clouds marching steadily across a deep blue sky. The magician found herself distracted, watching her shadows race across the far shimmering emerald expanse. Birds warbled and trilled from waving branches, and little furry things darted through the bush. In a distance, an almost colobo darkness drifted through the air until Rumia went clonk on a stately pine and plunged through the canopy with a cry. What a lovely day for an invasion. Al shook her head. Downstairs, the traveler was still asleep, snoring to shake the raptors. Either he picked the red shanghai up or he'd nestled himself in his arms at some point. She wasn't sure which would be otter. She had to stay over waking him, drumming her fingers on a love seat's back. Why are you supposed to do a guess in the morning? She was tempted by her old method. Humans tend to sort of disappear when they were ready, and that was much easier on everyone. Anyway, the smell of bacon will wake him up right quick. She's getting hungry herself anyway. When was the last time she ate? There was something she just never bothered to figure, figure out concerning her new body, trusting his sucker is bound to keep her from starving if she misjudged. Though, with her luck, the next instant involved a famine or maybe mass poisoning. Fortunately, she had a ceiling spell for her larder, so nothing went to waste even with her inhumanly light appetite. Bang with the spell, she dismissed it, hurling the boy from rest and halfway across the room. Right, she forgot about that. Their conversation over the breakfast of them all commanded a few awkward smiles and maybe half a sentence. I better get going soon, he said, carrying dishes to the kitchenette. He paused half turned back, short started washing them. He didn't seem to mind the faucet, find the faucet strange. Had the cap of water company already reached a human village then? Thank you so much for giving me a place to stay. Of course, Alice turned away and moved her hands to the air, trying to connect the dolls and clean up and arranging themselves neatly. A few of them seemed to be fidgeting or looking around nervously, but it was probably just her imagination. Finally, he stopped outside to stoop together, and the boy started off, so I'm sling a light pack over her shoulders. He understood she wasn't much of a conversation, so I wanted to say his farewell while I was for a wave of her shoulders and screeched a little girl and hit the dirt as an out of control broomstick dive bombed him. Yahoo! The dark figure whooped past Alice before she could react and crash through a tree stops behind her, nearly avoiding taking out a chunk of her house. It was swept in a broad circle, invisible but impossible to miss, and all the yelling and splintering and bursting and canopy were shining well for a broomstick shot free from jockey and tumbled out of sight like a rag doll. L what the hell? The traveler wavered. She's early, Alice explained flatly. Hello, world! A cheerful voice called from overhead, straining sight as its owner climbed awkwardly toward them. Marissa didn't sound like a yokai asterisk, let alone one legendary for mendacity, greed, and brutality. This is the right place, yeah? Yeah, you look a lot like an Alice. Far away, the broomstick plunged in a room of spear of darkness and carried her out the air side, folded around its half. A shrill cry of, you gotta be kidding, it reached out faintly in a wind, but no one paid any mind. Poor Rumia. 
Marisa hopped down and neatly landed on her heels and faced by a 30-foot drop. She's about Alice's height, with long, wavy blonde hair and huge golden eyes lifting up a grin that threatened to split her head in half. She wore a brown black tunic and neatly shorts with a longer waist cape to get the image of a proper witch's dress. Ooh. Her high peak witch's hat nearly as extravagant as the story's claim, but still awesome enough to make Alice a little jealous. All right, I'm okay, the boy called on his feet. Nothing's broken. Uh, I'm going now. Alice gave him a nod. Bye, Alice's friend, Marisa yelled, waving brightly. Have a good trip wherever you're going. He wanted to distinctly beat a hastier treat. Friendly, she wasn't planning to see this dangerous person to be around. <laughs> so, how's it going, Marisa asked, turning back. Well, wait, first of all, how did Ryu put you up to this? I thought for sure you'd say no sale and end up fighting. Or is that still gonna happen? Are you one of those polite duelist type yokai where you balance, say nice things, and blast the shit out of each other? What? No. Alice shook her head. I mean, I prefer to observe the old forms, yes, but I thought that we, that is... I don't think there'd be any reason to... Uh... I get you, Marisa said easily. So let's give it a go. Um, pray, my good Alice, would you do me the honor of allowing me into your abode? She bowed, smirking up at her host. I... Yes, of course, Alice sputtered. They're gonna make small talk, weren't they? They're gonna try and get to know each other. This is to be a, a... a pleasant evening. Of all the absurd alien notions. Apart from her experiment last night when I was the last... When was the last time she had a friendly conversation? As they started her steps, magician found herself wishing she'd listen to Green, or even Indigo, come to think of it. I, um, didn't have much time to prepare. No, nope, Reba totally dropped me on your head out of the blue, Marisa agreed, stepping in and turning toward a wall to kick off her boots and mess with the our tunic and cape. She wore a light gray brows and her knees hurt for the warm weather. And by the way, you think it's a good look at me? I wasn't sure about the ass cape. <laughs> Alice blinked. I can't compare it to your normal manner of dress. She along with the think of some constructive say, I suppose it's serviceable if you don't mind the fact that your fair complexion makes your legs stand out. Ha, ah, well that's kind of the point, isn't it? She stepped to the shoe rack and waved a hand over her leg. I mean, who wouldn't want to frame these? I wouldn't know. Huh, guess she wouldn't, would ya? She eyed her respectively, let the matter drop. She turned to take the house in a expansive gesture. So, this is the mysterious domain of Alice, huh? Not bad, you make all these yourself? Perhaps half of them, then correct yourself two-thirds, rather the years I trade for. Oh sweet, you have action figures too. I action figures too? I- what? Yeah, you do. Giggling, and Marisa reached out and picked up a green-clad Shanghai doll and held out. This one's totally not a doll. She's way too badass. I bet she beats the other ones up when you're not looking. Of all the dolls I made that claim for. Um, she uh, stared uncertainly for a few seconds and finally ventured. Are you being silly? Well, yeah, of course. Of course, Alice echoed. Old habits return. Have a seat. I'll prepare some tea. Yeah, that sounds great. She flopped back on the couch, kicking her legs out. Gotta say, I wish me and Rima could do this more often, skipping right to the tea instead of a big Damaku war, I mean. Given your reputation, I imagine you enjoy the fights. Well, sure. She stood green up in her lap and started directing it through a little dance. Damaku's fun, but since the whole thing with a half-ghost chick and a huge zombie tree, I just want to kick back every once in a while, you know? Huh. Is this one of the ones you made? Yes. Blue flame left up beneath the teapot and Alice carefully turned to a perfect temperature. It didn't last long, her tea was just much a work of art as her dolls. One of my earliest, in fact. This is really weird. When I move her, I feel like she's holding the poses on her own. Oh yes, my dolls are very cooperative, she said sat proudly. Here's a subject she discussed easily, and that's not all I can do. Watch. Snapping her fingers for effect, Alice directed green and hopping on the table and gave the guest a curtsy. Marissa jolted back and kicked her chair away, hands flying for the primary motions of a deadly spell. Her eyes are wide and hard for green's feet and hit the table she was trying to bolt and raise the place on her way out. The legendary mini hankero, a wooden disc throbbing with eldritch power, appeared in her hand and ravened for release. Alice panted and lashed out from the middle strings of her whole workshop. Dozens of unassuming little plush and porcelain figures stiffened in rows, hiding lethal armored forms in their midst. Invisible webs snapped beneath their little bodies, forming a raise of magic circle she could choose from and activate in a moment's notice. Uh, Marisa's eyes darted around, reading the circles of spells can turn her blood to acid or grind her bones with toothpicks in an instant, but she held her ground. Magic soared through her frail body, far too much for a mere human to hold, her very being straining like a balloon stretched over the mouth of a fire hose. The mini hanker crackled softly, holding no power protector, but plain to incinerate everything around her. They were in an impasse. A curtsy, the witch finally said. Her voice is thin and harsh. That's all, Alice replied, trying for nonchalance. Well, she slowly straightened, lowering her weapon. The spell is cold nearby, loosened one to her, fading to the magic forest of the background. As one, a handful of dolls slumped lifelessly to the floor. Circles between them broke harmlessly, giving off a soft little disturbance as the magicians felt like shifts in the air pressure. Green slipped from the table and Marisa caught on was starting to stand off anew at her sudden motion. For a few seconds, all was silence. Finally, Marisa threw back her head and laughed, hugging Green to her chest. Of all the damn fool things, we're all gonna, we're gonna bully each other to hell just because she wanted to show off a little doll? Wow. Alice didn't think it was funny at all, but she smiled a bit at her reflex, she continued to laugh. Without looking, she picked a teapot at exactly the right moment, poured two cups only splashing a little bit. Her hands had stopped shaking by the time she offered a cup to her guest a cup of the finest tea or silence and art could provide. She took a sip and smacked her lips loudly. Not bad. A little sharp, though, huh? 
And that's the full chapter one there. I'm enjoying it. I think I will read through the whole thing. It's only four chapters. Why not? <laughs> 